Cecil, I'll start to th- maybe talk to you about the 10 game losing streak Atlanta was having, but I think I'm going to pass on that question. How are you doing this <laughs> you, can, you, you might have a chance we can do it next week. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was afraid it'd be the only time I've ever heard you not have an answer. Uh, yeah. So. Well, we, <laughs> our, our two I listeners are turning radio. I think the answer to that one is pretty obvious. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to pass. <laughs> Got to recruit a little better than they. It, it, yeah, I think Cecil, it's back. called the Jimmies and the Joes, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I read your article this morning. It's another always a good article. I I don't know. I can't decide in my own mind if uh, if you know eighty thousand is going to be important to recruiting or not, or are they going to be able to say that you know Alabama is sliding down? People are taking Alabama for granted. Talk a little bit about if, if, what your article. Or just talk about what you think. I know you asked the question, and, and it mm-hmm. was a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's a situation where I, I think when when Coach Saban first arrived, it really was a big deal. I think anything that, you know, the program was down and anything that shows the program got was coming back up was a positive, and people were looking for that, and that's something that uh, that particular game, his first game, it was unbelievable. I was on the field. I had media coaches. I was a media coach that year. And so you could just see people coming, and they just kept, you know, you expected half full, and then it's three quarters full, and they just kept coming. I don't know how many people ended up being there outside the stadium and milling around, because you know how 8A is. People come and go. Um, yeah. It was unbelievable. And people picked up on that and talked about what a big positive it is. So I think this coach has always wanted to replicated and then other programs around the country when urban meyer got to ohio state they made a big deal about his first a day kirby smarts makes a big deal about about their g day this year and how many people they're going to have so it gets to be a competitive yeah. situation i don't i don't know that any prospect is going to pick a, a school just, just say well i went there and boy there were a bunch of people at a day but I do think it is a positive feeling on campus if there's a lot of excitement. Um, I do think they pick up on that. See, so is it harder for what Nick Saban did, which is harder, I guess, getting it to the top, the process of getting it to the top, or maintaining it like he has at the top? Which was more difficult or is more difficult? Well, it depends a little bit on, on what place you're talking about, Barry. If you have the resources to get it to the top, you know, there's some places – it's not just hard to get it to the top. It's impossible because you don't have enough yeah. resources and so forth. But if you're at Alabama, you know, if you're at Ohio State, if you're at LSU, you can do it. It, it takes hard work. I think with your players, it's much harder to keep it at the top. And I know this was the case in 2010. They had worked so hard in, in 2008, had gotten to the SEC championship game, played a very close game against Florida and lost it. So they're motivated in 2009. They, they got a chip on their shoulder. They're, they're fired up, and they win it. They go undefeated. Uh, but then when you do that, it is a real tendency on everybody's part, on, on I'm, I'm not just going to say players, on people my age, to say, well, I've done it. Why do I have to, have to act like I hadn't done it and do all that hard work again? Yeah. And, and so I think they had a, a problem with that in 2010 with, Getting everybody to buy in that you you what you did last year is last year. So I think to to win four in the time span that they've won four is just really remarkable because you have to you have to go back out there and realize how hard you have to work. And I think that's one reason why, sort of paradoxically, Coach Saban says what really helped them last year was to lose that old Miss game where where. It grabbed their attention. It got them back in that mindset of, of the kind of work they had to do, the kind of focus that they had to have to win all the rest of their game. So I think it's really difficult to, to stay on top, to, to get it on top and to stay on top. Well, they're in a situation, uh, which is fine, that, uh, that they feel that spending money makes money. And I think I think the powers that be some time ago decided that by letting him spend money, he could make money. And that's what happened. I don't think that that's ha- didn't happen in 32 years I was there, but no. uh, it's it, it's a completely different. You know, they all wanted to talk about this era versus Coach Brown, all that kind of stuff. But never ever 
uh, have you been able to spend money to make money? And uh, that shows the, abil- the abilities they think and he, he has in order to do that. It's kind of kind of interesting to me, uh, you know, to look at something like that because you and I have been around there so long. Or I had used to be. <laughs> right. And, and Coach Bryant, uh, as you know, he, he'd grown up, been through the Depression, and, and had the attitude that a lot of people in that generation had, that if sure. you have it, you better hang on to it. You know, it, it could be gone the next day and, and – they were they were very cautious, very prudent, Coach Bryant and Coach Bailey, about what what they would spend. They understood the the need for for um, some spending in facilities and so forth. But uh, they were uh, they were very frugal with with day to day kind of things. And now yeah. it's just a different generation. It's just yeah, a it different is. time. There's a lot of money pouring in, and Coach Bryant foresaw that. He did see that it was. Be television money and be that kind of uh, that kind of money, but but I don't think anybody realized just how much it would be. And Coach Saban came at a time when the entire university philosophy under Dr. Witt was expansionist. Want to get bigger, want to grow, want to build, and it's it's worked out for him. It's worked out perfectly. Cecil, we're talking to Cecil Hurt with the Tuscaloosa News. You know, one of the things we talked about in the last segment, I don't know if I've ever seen it this way before, but it seems like, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, between the players and the coaching staff and Coach Saban steering the ship, there's a lot of trust. Uh, there's a lot of trust there. When you got great players and then you have trust, they trust uh, that what he tells them about maybe not going pro is the right thing. They trust when he tells them, hey, wait your turn. Uh, you'll be ready. Uh, they seem to buy into what he says. Uh, and I think once you have that, you have the opportunity to have a great football program if you have the great players. Do you see that? Do you see the players and coaches trusting one another? Sure. And, and it, again, that comes down from the top. And it comes from winning. You know, the players see – that if you do the things that the coach says to do, that you're going to win, that it's been successful. So it, it's easier to, to sell that. It's tough to sell. you got to work hard. You've got you've got to pay attention to detail. You've got to go to class and then go out and, and lose on Saturday. You know, the, people start to say, well, why, why am I doing it this way? Why? There's, there's no questioning why I'm doing it this way. And then when you get success from that at the end, then that just builds on itself. And now, and then in turn, that builds on itself for them now in recruiting. Because yeah. kids know that's the deal coming in. They don't recruit kids by saying, you're going to be the big star. You know, we're going to build a program around you. Uh, they tell you up front, this is the way it's going to be. Talk to the other players. Because your greatest recruiters are always your own players. They're going to tell a kid the truth when he's on campus. So they tell them this is the way it's going to be, and then you see these are what the results are, whether it's winning on the field or whether it's getting drafted into the NFL. So that makes it that, – that's where winning builds winning is because then your players are bought in. Then when they recruit for you, which all players have to do, then the recruits that they bring in come in with no illusions about what it's going to be like and understand that they're going to have to work hard. And then on top of that – you're so successful in recruiting that you don't have to put up with anybody. If somebody doesn't want to do that, go on the door and go get somebody else. Good point. Well, I think he has the ability to to recognize other coaches. By that, I mean he's going to hire the defensive backfield coach at Kentucky. I mean he's going mm-hmm. to hire yeah he's going to hire uh, the offensive line coach from South Florida, where he was from, up Central Florida. I mean in. And I, and I note that just about every time that he says something about the guy that he's hired, the first word he mentions is recruiting. Right. Uh, he, he mentions the word recruiting, and then he goes forward and says the guy's, you know, been Central Florida, all, so forth and so on. So, you know, I, I, it's been interesting to me to, to see what, what would be, to me, an off-the-wall hire uh, in a, on both sides of the football, and it turned out to be the right hire. That's hard to do. <laughs> you know, part of that, as you know, you've been you've been years and years recruiting, knowing what guys were tough to recruit against. Yeah, you know, who who was getting players that maybe at a place like you, you mentioned, maybe at Kentucky football, where right. you might not expect them to get that player, and they're getting right. that guy, so you know he, he's doing a good job. 
But you got to have. I mean, you were a great assistant. You got to have great assistants around you. I think that's what to shift gears to the other sport. I think that's what Avery was looking for uh, when he goes out and gets a John Pelfrey. You, you got to uh, have help like that. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of basketball, you know. Do you think Avery, uh, maybe his staff, have they found their niche in recruiting? You, you got to fi- get to that job. You got to find out that job and kind of how that job works. It was difficult for those guys this year in state. Now next year, there is a lot of players in the state. And that's where you got to build it. But have they found their niche uh, in recruiting basketball players to Alabama yet? I, I think he's starting to understand that. It's a combination of things that's, that's tough. You don't want to just just say, well, you know, this this first year, this second year, I don't care what we put on the floor. You know, we just want to recruit. We'll be good in, in year three. You know, they're trying to get some players and transfers like they had last year with Arthur Edwards where they put a competitive team on the floor every year. But but the key for them ultimately is going to be how they recruit these kids in 2017 yeah. and 2018. The other thing in basketball to me is when you get hired in March, you're you're behind. You're not only behind on kids that are going to sign in November. You're behind all the way till the next November, yeah. because the cycle. Most of these kids have been recruited starting in ninth or tenth grade. So I think they're just now, you know, and over the course of this summer, going to be catching up with some people. Um, and I think that'll help. But yeah, the first you know your first year in recruiting basketball. Yeah, it, it, you're you're six feet underwater because you're so far behind on the really good kids uh, that that you just have to sort of start building relationships with some younger kids and and do the best you can for for really I think a year I think it takes you a year and a half to get caught up. These days. Yeah, it's almost like you know I think you're right, and then you got a guy like John Petty up there in Huntsville, and, and Kentucky's messing around in there. I don't know how hard they're going, but it's almost like Nick Saban and them getting in the back into Mobile and getting Julio Jones or one of those guys. You got to get mm-hmm. the, you got to get the first one to kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, how important is this 2017 class? I, mean, I don't. I don't know how good the Alabama basketball job is. Number one, they don't have very good players in the state. Number two, you know, there's been a lot of guys leaving. If they're going to be good and go uh, back to the NCAA tournament on a consistent basis, we got to start keeping these kids in state, don't we, Cecil? Yeah, what has been most successful has been built with kids from Alabama, you know, western part to Atlanta of Georgia and Mississippi. Uh, you know, you, you might go – elsewhere and, and get a kid but it's it's tough it's and there's so many programs first of all basketball as far as big programs you know you've got a lot of big where you've got you're in there with villanova georgetown and marquette you know that's pretty tough and those they don't exist in football you know there's yeah. not a, any competition from from those guys so there's more people trying to get a, a, a more limited pool of players so it's it's really difficult. Um, so the one thing you do have if you're a state university is some geographical advantages in your state. Now, yeah, I'm you two know, and uh, it's complex with with all the shoe company involvement and so forth that that gets into basketball recruiting. But I do think the state university always has some advantages in the state, and you've got to look for any advantages that you you can possibly find as competitive as it is in basketball. Well, I think he's done a good job as far as getting the fans back some degree, and you know mm-hmm. they're they're back and interested in the program a little bit more than they uh, a lot more than they were uh, in past years. I think uh, I might, well, I wasn't here the entire time, but um, you know they're on the right they're on the right road. And he's got good assistant coaches, so I think in a matter of time they'll be okay. Cecil, so we yeah, appreciate. You, you. Go ahead. Sure. No, I was just I was going to say you got to have fans in the seats. Plus, you got to have. When you're talking about recruiting in state, you got to have the people in those communities. If there's a kid yeah. in, in Phoenix City or there's a kid in, in Montgomery, you know, they, there's got to be some interest in Alabama basketball there, too, where they hear some talk about. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. See, so one last question before we let you go. I know you go around, you see all these facilities that people have uh, basketball wise. And I know they put a lot of money in Coleman Coliseum, but in your opinion, is it time to, to maybe start getting the plans together to get a new arena here to kind of get this thing uh, to where they're on par with everybody else? I think it's time to to put together a plan. If that plan is, you know, 
build a new one, then then start getting that paperwork done. You know, the committee's formed and where you're going to put it and so forth. I think it's at least time to look at the options. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not engineer, architect, all those things. I don't know how much money you'd be talking about. But, again, it's a time, as, as Coach Sanderson says, of spending money. So it's a time to look at the feasibility of doing that, uh, whether they end up doing it. Uh, I don't know, but you can't have one in five years if you don't start looking now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cecil, man, we appreciate it. Thanks, Cecil. Appreciate, appreciate it. you being Glad to do it.